was trying to take these reinforcement learning models and try to use them to understand um, <laughs> okay. Okay. Yeah, it's okay. going. It's going. Yeah. Okay. Um, try to use these reinforcement learning models to understand things related to um, mood, mood, emotion, emotion phenomena. Uh, so what I'm going to present today is um, uh, now I mentioned that uh, some of the work that's gone is kind of is starting to kind of go into this area to do with the subjective experience of of emotion. So I'll try to. Um, we published a theory paper last year um, called the Model of Mood as Integrated Advantage. So I'm going to present just a part of that um, data here, the part that kind of is most strongly linked, I think, to the subjective experience of emotion. I'll be curious to talk afterwards and see whether that kind of corresponds to the way that you've been studying it. Um, but that seems like the most obvious point of contact. Okay, uh, so sorry for those uh, who are on YouTube. Uh, we were a bit delayed, but five minutes. Um, okay. So uh, uh, today uh, we have a guest speaker, Daniel Bennett, uh, who uh, used to be a uh, student in uh, Olivia Carter's lab uh, when, uh, yeah. yeah, for a really long time ago. And then around that time, same, uh, same time, uh, I was also joined in Monash University. So we had a tenuous link of, you know, uh, considering taking Daniel as a RA at the, at the time, but uh, I didn't have a proper funding at the time, so oh. we didn't do that <laughs> in the end. And so he did the, uh, yeah, PhD with uh, Stefan Bold and also Karsten, and then went to uh, uh, Princeton to do uh, rather interesting work. And today uh, he's going to talk about the uh, mood of uh, model of mood as an integrated uh, advantage, a computational model of the emotion, but his uh, uh, important uh, fact is that uh, new faculty in uh, Monash University, so uh, it's going to be uh, great to hear what he wants to do, uh, what, what he has been doing, and what he wants to do in the future uh, in this talk. And maybe we'll have some uh, 30 minutes, uh, after starting 30 minutes or 25 minutes, uh, we'll have a short break, and then we'll go into the details of the uh, talks. Is that all right? Yeah, that sounds great. Okay. So this is, um, the, most of these slides are from a longer talk, so I'm going to kind of focus on the first part of it. There will be many more slides that I can get through, but hopefully that, if we have questions after the break, we'll be able to that. Okay, so I want to start with kind of an intuitive example, what hopefully intuitive example, that dates from back when I was living in the United States, to do with the interaction between subjective experiences of events in the world and emotional states. Um, and specifically, I'm going to talk about something which was really relevant to me when I first put these slides together, which was the link between my commute and a very extensive commute of time across two states in the USA, through New Jersey and through New York. Uh, the link between that and my mood. Um, so, a typical morning for my... Uh, okay. So, a typical morning uh, might involve waking up, having a cup of coffee, going down, getting the train out of New York Penn Station on New Jersey Transit, which is not a very nice experience, maybe reading the news, and then uh, maybe going on to take uh, the New York City subway. And what we can do is we can kind of plot what my average mood would have been across this commute. So we can say maybe it starts from some So we can kind of plot what my mood would be like over the course of this time. So maybe I start from some baseline, wherever I'm at when I wake up, my mood improves when I have my coffee, my mood deteriorates when I get on New Jersey Transit, uh, because I made these slides in 2019, or any time in the last three years, my mood deteriorated more when I read the news, mm -hmm. and then my mood deteriorated even more when I was on, when I was on the subway. Maybe I got bitten by a rat or something like that. Anyway, the point I'm trying to make here is that this is one half of the link. This is only one half of the link. So this is the, um, my appraisals of the events that I'm experiencing have influences on my mood. But the link also goes in the other direction. So the, kind of the affective state that I'm in, the mood state that I'm in at any, any given point in time changes the kinds of behaviours that I make. Um, to give a really simple example, um, which was absolutely true, at the end of this commute, depending on how I'm feeling, might change my probability of you know, buying myself a, a Snickers bar or something like that. That's a, that's a simple example of how my mood might affect my behaviour. 
but you can imagine that there might be more kind of serious pervasive effects as well. So the question we're trying to ask in this project is why should it be the case that there is both a link between uh, the events we experience and our mood and also backwards from the mood to kind of that affects the sorts of uh, events that we are going to experience through the, uh, the behaviour that we'll make. Um, so to put this in a kind of a formalism which may be familiar to anyone who's kind of spent time with reinforcement learning, we can sort of imagine, we can extract away a lot of those details and say that a lot of cognitive problems can be reduced to an agent, which is represented here by this robot, uh, acting in the world. And what the agent does is it takes actions, and in response to those actions, the uh, agent observes rewards. These are good or bad things that can happen to it. And it gets observations as well about kind of what state of the world that it's in. So the field of reinforcement learning has done a lot of work uh, developing algorithms that explain how exactly intelligent agents, humans, other animals, uh, in silico agents like AlphaGo or something like that, how the principles by which these agents can operate in the world to achieve their goals. Um, and one thing that comes out of that is that you can get a very long way with these reinforcement learning models, you can, you can learn to behave even optimizing in some situations. So the question we're trying to ask here is why should it be the case if these algorithms are good for uh, learning behaviors that humans and also non-human animals aren't just kind of involved in this circuit, they're also dragging this affective state, this mood state along with them. Why might it be the case that that, uh, that, that would be there? And in particular, because we know that in addition to the direct link between the world and an agent, uh, receiving rewards, we also have a link via mood. So we know that the rewards and the observations that we receive affect the mood. This would be kind of a subway example. And we also know that the mood state affects actions kind of semi independently of the actions that the agent themselves is choosing. This is my snippets example. So, why the question we're trying to get at here is why should it be the case that we need this extra link via mood in here as well as the kind of the more commonly understood link? Uh, and one of the, uh, I can see there's a question, yeah. Hmm? Uh, apologies if I should leave questions to the end, but I just wanted to clarify. So when you're saying mood as distinct from like observations of the state of the world, um, are you also imagining it as distinct from like the like previous? Is it distinct? I guess what I'm trying to clarify is observations of the world, the like previous second extensory input to the agent, and like mood, whether those are all different things, or whether like the observations and the mood. Uh, distinctly different things, if that makes sense. I think it makes sense. I would say here, and hopefully I'll make this clearer as we, as we go through, um, though if not, we can discuss it more afterwards. What I would say is um, observations are a kind of input that the, um, that the world gives to an agent in this RL kind of paradigm, but uh, mood is a property of the agent. Um, so observations are something that's coming in, mood is something that is being affected by those observations and by rewards within the agent. Does that, does that answer your question? Uh, yeah, I think I'll, I'll ask more later, but that's okay. a good, good start, thanks. Okay, cool. Thanks. Can, um, can you see other, other uh, questions? Raising hand? Uh, I, I can't really, so um, I have, I can see one person here. Um, okay. Uh, can you also do one move for raising hand and check box questions? Yeah, I mean, can we make it like, ah, yeah, that's good. All right. Uh, okay, Anim, uh, Niromiti. Um, yes, I have a question. So, uh, does mood affect the way you appraise, like, a, does mood uh, affect appraisals of a particular observation or an event? Um, is that? The, the, the short answer is yes, probably. Um, part of what, um, the second half of this talk, which I'm not going to be able to give, uh, but we can talk about this more, concerns some the sort of like the mathematical model and mm -hmm. how, uh, one way in which that might be, that might be working. Um, I'm going to focus, of these two arrows here, I'm going to focus on the ones from rewards to mood. But there's there's absolutely evidence for a link between mood and actions as well. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. All right. Um, so what I'm going to try and do here is sort of start broad and start by kind of drawing on some of the philosophy of affective science to try and um, get an idea of what the phenomenology of mood is for a human um, and try to work out what properties it has that we would want a theory of mood to explain. Uh, then I'm going to talk through the theoretical model that we developed, which we call the integrated advantage model. And I'm going to show you some evidence that this model can account for empirical data pretty well. Um, part four there is that second arrow. I'm probably not going, to, not going to get to that, but I have some slides to talk about it as well. Okay. So what is the phenomenology of mood? 
So, first to be clear about what I'm talking about, when people talk about mood, emotion, affect, uh, constructs like this, one of the most common ways of dividing them up is to distinguish between two cardinal dimensions, one of which is uh, the horizontal dimension here, which is valence, so running from unpleasant emotions through to uh, pleasant emotions. And another way of, uh, another cardinal dimension, cardinal axis of this um, space is arousal, which is deactivation, is kind of low energy things, uh, activation is sort of high energy things. So for instance, uh, if you are, let's say, relaxed, that would be described as a positive valence or pleasant valence, low activation, low arousal state. Uh, and I want to be clear that I'm not kind of giving a model of all the dimensions in this space, I'm really focusing on this horizontal dimension here. So the appraisals of how pleasant versus unpleasant some of these. Arousal is a whole different dimension I'm not covering. Okay, but um, I, as to sort of the empirical study that arrived in you know, this you know, uh, two-dimensional thing, which is extremely you know, popular and famous, mm -hmm. Do you know if anybody actually collected the empirical data based on, let's say, similarity or distance of each experienced emotion, and uh, whether that actually arrives at this kind of two-dimensional structure? People have done a little bit of work, but canonically where it comes from is from similarity judgments, but not of phenomenological experience, of um, uh, words and mm. singularly. Mm. Um, so uh, if you ask people to list a bunch of different emotion words mm. and classify emotion words, it sort of comes out that across cultures, across languages, these seem to be the dimensions that they cluster on. Mm. So that's a, a indicative evidence in the sense that we would expect linguistic boundaries to respect, mm. to, to sort of co vary in some way with, with um, uh, phenomenological experience, but it doesn't ad directly address this question. Mm. Um, one reason people haven't done that so much is because it's hard to work out exactly what empirical measurement to take of it because. Um, mm. The gold standard for a lot of this is just asking people how they feel. Mm. And in order to ask uh, somebody how, how they feel, you sort of have to presume some dimensions already. So you might say, how happy are you on a scale from unhappy to happy? How, you know, how are you feeling on a scale from completely relaxed to completely you know, high energy? Mm. It's, it's a really interesting question, but I'm, I'm, at least in my knowledge, um, nobody has really dug deep on that kind of phenomenological uh, side of things. They're probably, it's also related, but uh, I guess the answer will be no, but nobody probably asked uh, sort of the similarity of the experience from one emotion to the uh, e emotion A, experience of A to B, compared to B to A. Like, you know, I can imagine like, you know, yes, yeah, asymmetry. Like, you know, after I'm now in yeah. sad mood and then becoming like very happy, mm. you know, I might feel like, you know, the, the similarity of distance to be 10, mm. but if I'm now a happy state and then become like a sad state, yeah, it yeah. might feel like you know, five or something like that. Part of what you're getting at, the, the other, um, and I may be telling things that you're very much across already, but one of the other, this is one set of dimensions that people use to cover up the space. The other common one doesn't go from unpleasant to pleasant, it goes mm -hmm. from neutral to pleasant, mm -hmm. and then separately from neutral to unpleasant. Mm -hmm. So instead of having one bipolar scale, I see, there are two unipolar scales. I see. And that's a little bit more useful if you want to explain phenomena like, um, for instance, mixed emotions mm. or mixed episodes mm. in bipolar disorder. So mm. people, where people show features of mania and features of depression at the same time. That's very hard to account for here because basically it, it, it's positing uh, an extremely rapid oscillation from one end to the other. Right. Whereas if you have two independent axes, then you, you can stay at one point, which is high on, on both of those. Mm -hmm. um, so we sort of have presumed, for, for a bunch of reasons which I'm happy to go into, we have presumed this bipolar conceptualization of balance, mm -hmm. but there's uh, ways you could rewrite the model where it could probably touch on that other, um, other Thanks, uh, conceptualization as well. Okay. Um, okay, going more into the phenomenology of mood, it has three properties that we kind of want a uh, theory to explain. So the first of these, um, and this is kind of, not every theory of mood has all of these properties, this is stuff that, this is stuff that kind of distilled from reading a few different things. The first is that mood is an integrative uh, process or an integrative state. It doesn't just reflect the most recent thing that happened to us, it, kind of, it reflects uh, the sum total of a lot of recent experiences and the time, the time window for that integration might vary between people and it might vary across time within a person. But it's built an intuition for this, you can sort of, maybe it's obvious to say that mood is not just the most recent thing we've experienced, but you can imagine you just experienced um, the death of a loved one. Um, you're feeling a lot of negative emotion and while you're in town for the funeral, you go out with family and you have quite a good meal. You might feel marginally better as a result of having a good meal, but it doesn't change the fact that this is overarching experience which has kind of been carried around in your, in your mood as well. Um, a 
probably uh, specifically from kind of the philosophy of emotion, um, people say that mood is non-intentional, um, where intentionality is a specific way, um, it doesn't mean intending something, here it means whether something has an object. Mm. So we can say that um, if I feel, you know, if I uh, forget some vegetables in the bottom of my fridge and I pull them out and I kind of feel disgust, mm. that disgust, that emotion has an object. The object is, you know, the disgusting onions in my, in my uh, crisper drawer. Um, and you can, uh, you can sort of think of similar things for a lot of other emotions like joy or pride or guilt. Um, but what's often said about mood is that it doesn't have a specific object. Um, it kind of is a uh, pervasive, um, uh, kind of all-encompassing state that doesn't necessarily get attributed to one particular thing. Mm. Um, so if someone's in an extremely negative mood, they might not be able to point to the, the, the object, the thing that has elicited that, that negative mood. And this is particularly the case in think of uh, depressive episodes, for instance. Mm. That's not necessarily often trauma or some other event precedes it, but it's not about those things in the same way as discussed as a piece of rotten fruit. It's about the rotten fruit. Um, and the most important property for the work that I'm presenting here is that mood is contextual. Um, and what I mean when I say contextual is that the exact same stimulus um, can have a very different effect on mood depending on the way in which we appraise that stimulus. Or another way of saying this is depending on the psychological context that that event occurs in. Um, so let me make that a little bit more concrete. You can imagine, um, let's say you're working in the corporate world and you receive uh, from your boss an end of year bonus of $20,000. That you might experience that as pleasant if you had not been expecting a bonus at all. But if your boss had told you to expect a bonus you know, of around $50,000, then this is the same thing, the same stimulus is likely to be experienced as quite unpleasant. Mm. That's kind of a toy example, um, but a lot of what I'm doing in this project is kind of exploring some of those contextual influences to see if we can map them onto concepts in reinforcement learning models. Okay. So there are three specific contextual effects on mood that I'm going to talk about um, in this presentation, and I want a I want my theory of mood to kind of be able to explain in some way. So the first one um, is pretty much the one I just mentioned to you. So mood changes in mood in response to a stimulus are in proportion to the difference between prior expectations and the actual outcome. So the, that $20,000 bonus, if that's $20,000 more than expected, then that's going to be appraised positively. If that's $20,000 less than expected, that's going to be appraised negatively. Um, you can also imagine like if you um, uh, place a bet and win $100 as, um, on a, you know, a horse at the races that had a 50% chance of winning, you might be less excited, less pleased by that win of $100 than if you had bet a smaller amount of money on a long shot horse and that kind of horse came first. You're more surprised. And that's likely to have a stronger effect on your, own, on your mood, that stimulus. Another one that I'm particularly interested in, um, and maybe we should talk about this afterwards, because it links with some kind of counterfactual learning uh, tasks that I'm quite interested in, uh, is the effect of counterfactual information uh, on mood. So that counterfactual information is knowledge about uh, what would have happened if you'd done something different. So let me make that more concrete. Here's a little game show example, and I'm really glad I can kind of present in person again because I can actually ask people to raise their hands in response to me. Okay. So imagine I'm a game show host, you're a contestant on a game show, uh, tell you behind the left door is either a $500 prize or a $2,000 prize. It can be either, there's an equal chance. Um, behind the right door is either nothing or a $1,000 prize. Um, can I get a show of hands for who would choose to open the left door? To open the right door. Okay, so I think it's mostly left, some are committed, just not. Um, and our own goes like that. Okay. Um, so let's say now that the, um, uh, the game show host opens your chosen door and you find $500 behind there, that you're going to experience some negative surprise because this is, you know, this is the worst of the two possible outcomes, but it's still better than nothing. It's still a win of $500. Then the game show host, because they're cruel, tells you, okay, I'm going to open the, the door on the right as well. And you see that you would have won $1,000 if you'd opened the door on the right. So this is, this elicits negative emotion. Right? This is, this is uh, people uh, feel that they made the wrong decision in hindsight, even though in foresight, it, when planning to make the decision, you know, it is the right decision. In expectation, you should always choose the door on the left. It's just that it can sometimes lead to the specific outcome where um, you are experiencing negative counterfactual emotion. That is the contrast between the thing that you chose uh, and the thing that you didn't choose or that you could have had if you'd done something different is negative. 
Um, on the other hand, if you'd chosen the right hand draw here, then you would be feeling uh, positive. You would probably uh, feel positive mood, positive emotion, even though I'd say objectively you made the wrong decision. Okay. Uh, so that's counterfactual effects. Um, and the third one is something called action to the habit effect, um, which is that some actions that we take every, um, in our lives are things that we do commonly, some actions are things that we do uncommonly, uh, and the finding that comes from some old prospect theory work from Kahneman University is that the outcomes that follow atypical actions affect our emotions more strongly than the outcomes that follow typical actions. So again, let me make that concrete. So um, I think the classic example of this one involves imagining two people who uh, got into a car crash while driving home from work. Uh, person A and person B have got into a car crash separately. Uh, person A got into a car crash uh, while driving on the same route that they go on every day. So maybe I'm driving home to Flemington and I go on the Monash Freeway and I get in the car crash there. Person B uh, experienced a car crash uh, when they had gone a different way. They'd gone a scenic route that they don't normally know. I think, I think uh, I'm going to go down Downtown Road, I'm going to go through St Kilda, I'm going to the beach, and on, uh, on Marine Parade, I get into a car crash. If you ask people who they think would experience more negative emotion as a result of the same event, which is having a car crash, people typically say that it is the person who has experienced that after taking more atypical action. Um, maybe, maybe you agree, maybe you don't agree with me. And that also interacts with the positive and negative outcomes? It does, yeah. There's, there's asymmetries in all of these. Um, the general finding is that negative uh, is stronger than positive. So um, mm. uh, if we go back to the counterfactual example, if you'd chosen the left and you could have got more if you'd chosen the right, that negative emotion may, is, is most people stronger than the positive emotion that you would if you had chosen the right and you could have got the left. Um, that's on average money. Okay, so these are the three effects. So, yeah. Can I just go back with the previous example? If you switch it into uh, like a punishment, so like you have to pay some amount of dollars. This uh, is money. Yeah, yeah, exactly. So does it work similarly? Like, well, let's, let's work it out. Um, so the idea would be behind the left door, either you lose $500 or you lose $2,000. Yeah. Behind the right door, either you lose $0 or you lose $1,000. Yeah. In this case, because it's punishment to make the correct option, most people would choose the right door because mm. on average you're going to lose less. And then uh, imagine these are losses now. You lose $1,000 and you find out that if you'd chosen the other one, you would have only lost $500. Yeah. So you kind of, it's more there as well you feel negative emotion because you made, you made the right decision, but things would have turned out better for you if you'd done the, the other thing. Yeah. yeah. So it should work in both positive and negative domains. Um, those well, sadly, there's a little bit of a debate about this. Some people say the punishment effects are stronger. I, I think that carries out a little bit. Mm. Yeah, interesting. Okay. All right. So what I'm going to present now is I'm going to try and present a, a model, and I'll try and keep it at a high level, though I will have a bunch of equations on the screen and we can walk through them uh, if it's of interest. Uh, I'm going to try and present um, the model that we developed, which tries to meet these three properties. It is contextual, it is non-intentional, and it is integrative. Okay. Uh, and it, I wanted to explain these three phenomena, the surprise effects, the counterfactual effects, and the um, action to the currency effects. The first thing to say is this is not by any means the first computational model of mood. People have been working on this for the last seven, eight, nine years. So two names that come up, well, I three names that come up over and over again, um, are Rob Rutledge, um, who is at Yale, uh, Iran Eldar, uh, who was a, um, a PhD student with Yale, that's now leading the lab um, in uh, Israel. Uh, and yeah, okay, please address something my, my perspective. Um, so these three papers all kind of are computational models of mood that precede the one that I'm um, presenting to you today. Uh, the model I'm presenting also kind of fits within a longer tradition in affective science of trying to use ideas from economic decision theory, from um, engineering control theory, uh, other places as well, to try and explain um, the appraisals that drive moods. So this is kind of this is just sort of the broader theoretical context that I would say that this this fits into. Um, and uh, what I'm going to do is I'll start by drawing this up just uh, by talking about what reinforcement learning is to start with. I'm not sure how much detail to go into here, um, so I might just ask, are people in the room here, are these, are they, do you use reinforcement learning models, are you familiar with the equations at all? Maybe it's better to go from the scratch. From scratch? Okay. Right. So, let's say here.
Right. So the fundamental building blocks are there are a series of different states in the environment. So I'm going to introduce this with, uh, with respect to this example here where we have our agent walking around in a very simple environment. There are nine states of the world, which is called the grid world. Um, and uh, in one of the states of the environment, if they go there, they get a reward. So the one in uh, the top row in the middle, they get a reward if they go there. So the, the nine different states of the environment, we'll denote those as S. Um, there are actions that the agent can take in each one of those states. So the action, uh, the agent starts in the bottom left corner, it's two actions, it can go up, or it can go right. Um, it's in the middle state, it can go in any of those directions. If it's up against the right wall, it can, it can go back towards the left. Um, R is the reward that is received by the agent after it takes an action. And what we can say in this environment is that reward is zero uh, in all states, except the state where it goes into it against this, this one. Uh, and then crucially, this is a really important concept, uh, it's denoted pi in reinforcement learning. It's called the policy. And what this is is a function that, uh, given a state, produces a probability distribution over actions. So if the agent knows that it is in the center state, well, actually, it's maybe if the, the agent knows that it's in the bottom left state, uh, it can go up or it can go right. So the policy is the function that specifies what's the probability of going up and what's the probability of going right. And then once we have those building blocks, um, there are some learnable functions. So uh, this function B is called the state value function. And what that uh, estimates is the value uh, of a particular state, so a particular one of these squares, is how much reward does the agent expect to get uh, if it starts from state S. The action value function depends on the state and the chosen action. And it is, given a particular state and a particular action, um, how much uh, expected reward does the agent expect to get. So to make this concrete, um, Imagine that the agent is kind of in the center state, right below the reward. There, the Q value of going up would be higher than the Q value of going down because the agent kind of can expect to get more reward if it goes up into the square where it's going, uh, where it gets the coin and goes down. So there's a previous reinforcement learning model of Mu that is the starting point for this, which comes from uh, Aaron Nobel's work. So the idea here is you might have heard of the concept, I'm sure you've heard of the concept of a, um, a reward prediction. So this is a, um, uh, a variable that's thought to be encoded in a dopaminergic midbrain uh, So it's roughly like 25 minutes. Okay. Should we take a break now? Because now you... Yeah. Okay. Okay. Then let's uh, take a break uh, five minutes. And then let's start from here. Okay. Yeah, that's a probably good point to take a break. Take a break um, right now. Just walk around. It's fine. I know. I'm not saying that those are the ones that ah. we can discuss after. Ah, right. So that's timer. Yeah. Okay. What kind of program do you use Python for the S? Um, the simulations in this paper were done in, in Python. Mm -hmm. um, in most of my work, I use R, but um, it happens that. I worked with this uh, guy called Guy Davidson, um, as well as the other and Guy did a lot of the coding of the, of the architecture that did the simulations on, yeah. and yeah, so that's all that's all in Python. Um, it should be in the background. If, you, if you're curious about this, there should be some code to help around some of these simulations that's kind of available online. Yeah, yeah, no, it's, it's yeah, definitely very interesting to do these models. Actually, like, yeah, it's, it's cool to like, be able to simulate things and, and then get the conclusions. Yeah, I, I think I think it's just such a good tool to have in, in the toolkit. And it's sort of, you don't have to. It's almost a, an excuse for laziness in some ways. You don't have to sit down and work out how things would look. You can just simulate a model and, and mm. see what happens. So I've heard that um, with uh, at least with uh, in the in the field of machine learning, there's still some kind of issues of, of replication. Like, uh, mm. do you know if if um, within reinforcement learning and like this kind of cognitive uh, uh, and computational psychology is, is replicability an issue? Because if you can share codes, then hopefully... Hopefully it helps, yeah. I, I heard a little bit about that stuff. I'm, I'm not really... My impression is that that, kind of, that relates to 
the fact that sometimes performance of algorithms on, so there are certain like tasks, certain benchmarks that you can use to say how good is my new reinforcement learning algorithm or my new deep neural network or something. Um, and the performance of those can vary quite a lot, like, apparently depending on you know, different random seeds that you used. Mm -hmm. and stuff like yeah. that. Um, so I would probably say that the stuff I'm presenting here is, like, I don't know, I've rounded enough times from enough different seeds that I'm, I'm confident, but um, yeah, I, I I don't think I have any more intelligent to say than that, except you know, I, I've heard some of those same things. Yeah, no. I mean, yeah, you would hope in computational work that you actually at least can avoid this kind of I know, I know. In theory, yeah, it would be, it would be sad to see that kind of the same thing that goes on in empirical work where you have a literature filled with non replicable, retro, replicable effects. It would be unfortunate if that happened in a, a kind of machine learning as well. Yeah, I think Elior has some questions, but I don't know if it's. Oh, yeah. Um, one minute of question. I was just going to say, I think I last heard you give a talk, Daniel, at the Decision Science Hub back at Melbourne Uni while I was still doing my PhD. Yeah, right. It's nice to see the follow up of like what's been happening for the past three years. Nice, um, nice. Um, so. do you, I, I probably would have been talking about something quite different, was it? Uh, I it's probably made memory that it was something computational psychiatry. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, which is why I was like, uh, I was like, oh, this talk looks really interesting. It looks like stuff I've seen before. And then when you started, I was like, oh, I have seen Daniel talk. Yeah, right, right. right. Yeah. So there's kind of different sides to take on things. Like, there's, there's definitely a more psychiatric angle I can, I can give on, on this talk. And I'm not, I'm not really doing that today because I'm you know, talking to people who do more computational stuff. Than that, I suppose. So, yeah, it's, it's kind of fun well, to it's, approach it's... it from different angles. Yeah, that's right. It's nice seeing how like it all ties together. Like I give such different thoughts to different audiences as well. So it's cool to see how someone else is doing it, seeing it from both sides. You've um, you've complimented me by saying it all ties together. Sometimes I'm not sure it does tie together. <laughs> okay, so shall we restart? Sure, whenever you're ready. I will um I will get the um the final substantive bit and then we can start. Yeah, maybe you, can you restart sharing? Yeah. Can we check who what's what's in the chat? That's uh Ariel and uh Niromiti, it's the response left. Uh, also, I uh, sorry. Before going further, there was um, there were a couple of questions on YouTube. Cool. So let me. The audio audio is very quiet. Um, now I realize that right now. Um, I don't know how we can. Can you, maybe can you move that mic to closer to Daniel? And can you try to speak yeah. uh, to it? Or yeah, and then can you try to speak? Uh, I'm speaking. Maybe can you, can you move that? Mic? Yeah, maybe I just noticed it too late. It probably feels okay, but um, let's see. All right. We can't change it? about that should have also recorded on zoom uh, in case but anyway let, let's let's get started I'll try and wrap this up. Uh, Phil raise a hand 
Uh, yeah. Sorry. Is it alright if I just ask a quick question about the counterfactual effect? Um, yeah. I was just wondering whether there's been any research into like the clinical implications of, say, patients holding deterministic beliefs um, and, say, reducing negative moves that are derived from these counterfactual effects. So if someone chose the left side and had the deterministic belief, whether that, say, reduced negative moods derived from that? Yeah, that's a really interesting question. The, the, short, the short answer is no, that, that particular study hasn't been done. The, the broader context for this is that there has been a little bit of stuff done on um, counterfactual processing and uh, mood, in, particularly in depression, um, but it comes from a different literature. It comes from kind of almost like social psychological literature, and it's not really con kind of quantitative and computational. So some of, some of the empirical work that I'm, so this is theoretical work, some of the empirical stuff that I'm doing at the moment is trying to actually kind of tap into some of those questions. Not, not exactly that one, which I think is really interesting, but, um, but yeah, that, that broad space. So maybe it could be yeah, an interesting subject for discussion. Yeah, thanks. Thank you. All right. Um, so the starting point here, and the jumping up point, is this previous uh, model where mood was assumed to integrate reward prediction errors. So what this does um, uh, is it accounts for some contextual effects, but not others. So if a reward prediction error is, if things are better than expected, it's a positive reward prediction error, if things are worse than expected, it's a negative reward prediction error. And so this model really nicely accounts for those expectation surprise effects that I was mentioning, but uh, it doesn't have anything to do with outcomes of actions not taken, so it can't really account for counterfactual effects. And there's nothing in there that makes reference to the, the typicality of an action, so it can't really account for that either. Um, so what we did in this model was, our proposal is that mood can be conceptualized as instead of being an integral of reward prediction errors, being an integral of estimates of this quantity which is called advantage. Um, and uh, this is just a formal way of saying that, but what advantage is, is it is, remember I mentioned these things, the Q value and the V value, the state value. So if you take the difference between the Q value of the action that you chose and the V value of the state that the action was chosen in, you get a quantity that's called advantage, which basically corresponds to, you know, uh, should I do that action more or less in the future? So if, if advantage is positive, then you did better from taking a particular action than you did from than you were expecting in the state that you were taking it in. And so you should take that action more. Um, if it's negative, then you should take the action less because it's worse than the state that it was taken in. So this is similar to reward prediction error in some ways, but it has some... Yeah, sorry, can, can you go slide, one slide back? Okay. Uh, one, one slide back before this. <clears throat> Okay. So R here is the reward, Q is the, the Q value of the chosen action. Yeah, okay, all right. So it works with some of the same quantities and it's still a, you know, a difference operation, but... Um, um, sorry, yeah. can you explain? Oh, maybe you're doing that in the next slide. I, I just want to know how this model applies to the door and... Yeah, yeah, I'm, I'm going to do exactly that. Yeah. Um, so it's a little bit simpler. So let's say the, the door on the left, the agent gets to reward 25% of the time. The door on the right, the agent gets to reward 75% of the time. What is the advantage for choosing, in, choosing each door? Well, this is a kind of, it's a slightly subtle question because it depends on the agent's policy. So remember I said the policy was the function that maps states into a probability of choosing different actions. So the optimal policy in this environment, the best thing that you can do if you're this agent is always choose the door on the right. That's how you can maximize your reward. So if you do that, um, then and that uh, advantage is Q minus V. So if you always choose the action on the, on the door on the right, then you'll receive reward on 75% of trials. So the, the value of the state should be 0.75, assuming rewards are zeros and ones. So then the advantage of being on the left is 0.25 minus 0.75, so you have negative advantage for choosing on the left and zero advantage for choosing on the right. That's not the optimal policy, but what if the agent is, you know, it's, it hasn't accounted these before and it starts out by choosing randomly. Under a random policy, those amounts change to negative 0.25 and 0.25 because under a random policy, the value of the state that they're in changes. So if you're choosing randomly in this environment, you will get a reward on 50% of trials. If, you're, if you've learned the environment and you know what to do, you'll get a reward on 75% of the trials. So that difference changes, uh, changes the advantage function, but it doesn't change the reward prediction errors. I can ask a question. Yeah. So by um, if, if you suggest that open, holding the door on the right is the optimal policy and one should always open the door on the right, doesn't that make zero um, the, the optimal policy for... Yeah. Doesn't make this one or something 
Because this, no, I mean, when you choose a random policy, that means you idle if there's on a on a fifty fifty percent chance. Yeah. So because you because there's you know seventy five percent of the time there's a door behind, there's a reward behind the door on the right. Okay. Um, then even if every single trial I um, I choose the door on the right, only on seventy five percent of those will there actually be a door there. Like it's always the right decision to go to go to the right, but there's not always going to be a reward on the right because only that's only going to be there seventy five percent of the time. And so it's 0.75 rather than. Mm. Um, I don't think I fully understand because which one does it represent? Like 75 chains of. Yeah. So, so this this one here, sorry, there's one. Um, this one here is the V. This is the Q. So this is the value of the state. Oh. This is the value of the action. Okay. Oh. So this is the value of the state, which changes with the policy, but the value of the action. So this is V? Yes. And then this is Q? Yes. So V changes as the agent's policy changes because the amount of reward you can expect to get on this state just uh, depends on the way you behave in the state. Um, but the values of the actions don't change because they're conditional on action already. They don't depend on the policy. And th this is action, yes. right? Uh, that's the uh, advantage of choosing the left door and the advantage of choosing the right door. Mm. And so, the, this is the policy? Uh, this is, um, right, yeah. So it's, this is just reinforcement learning terminology that when things are denoted at the star, that normally means the optimal policy. And I put random in there to indicate a, a random policy. So in reality, as if, if you were learning to do this task, if, you know, if you're a subject of one of my experiments, you would probably start out with a random policy and learn an optimal policy, and so you kind of your estimates of the advantage of, of things over time would start out looking like the ones below and move towards looking like the ones above. Yeah. So if you if you're a bit lost, maybe you need to probably come back to the top right equation. I could, I probably could have made that better. To map out. With all this, I included a link to the paper that all this stuff is published in, where it's actually laid out, and we tried to go in a lot of detail about this stuff. So hopefully that that might help as well. Um, okay, but let me move on to that. I don't want to take up too much more of your time. Okay. Okay. So this is a kind of technical point, but advantage is not something the agent can uh, observe directly. So these things. These things in this previous trial, these are expectations. These are amounts that you would get if you took each action an infinite number of times. Um, so it's an expectation which can't be directly observed. The agent can only observe the outcomes of its actions. And the key feature of this integrated advantage model is that there are different ways of combining the information that you receive in response to your actions. There are different ways of using that uh, to estimate how good the action you did was, how good the advantage is. And those different uh, ways of estimating the advantage correspond to the different so there's a kind of reward prediction error, which is related to the one I mentioned previously, but a little bit more complex. This is a uh, temporal difference error rather than a risk or awakening prediction error that's kind of in the weeds. Um, if you only get feedback on the chosen option, so if you don't know what would have happened if you'd chosen the other door, then you can calculate this. It's kind of like a reward prediction error. And that's a pretty good estimator of advantage. It's kind of high variance, but low bias. So on average, this should be equal to the advantage. Um, but if you get counterfactual feedback, so if you know not only what happened with what you uh, chose, but what would have happened with the thing that you didn't choose, mm. then there's a different way of estimating advantage that has lower variance. And that way is, uh, that's the equation, but, but intuitively it's you take the reward you actually got, multiply it by one minus the probability of, choose, of taking the action that you actually took, uh, and subtract the probability weighted average of the actions that you didn't take. Mm. So that's, uh, just to unpack that, that is, um, if you are very, very likely to do the thing that you did, so if you've got close to an optimal policy and you're always choosing the thing on the right, then this pi of A should be close to one. That is, you should be usually, the probability of taking the action that you took should be close to one. And so the first term becomes very small, uh, as does the second term. So basically the variance of this shrinks as you get closer and closer to a deterministic policy. Mm -hmm. On the other hand, things can get very large uh, if you start taking actions that you don't normally take. Um, and this, this policy way of reward difference, the reason it's important is because it's one way that you can estimate the advantage of your actions just on the basis of the rewards that you see. 
So that's really, I, I don't want to go into too much more detail um, because I've already got a lot of time, but that's kind of the key insight is that um, if we assume that, um, okay, so mood is a leaky integrator of estimates of advantage and that there are different estimate, different ways of estimating advantage, you can kind of average them together. Um, if, you, uh, if you have those two things, you can explain some of the empirical data. So here's some data by, uh, um, by Barbara Mallet in 1999. Um, basically, the task was one where um, this was choosing between different gambles. So the gamble on the left is there's, uh, the white is $8 win, the left is a $32 loss. So there's kind of, if you choose the gamble on the left, there's kind of an 80% chance of winning $8 and about a 20% chance of losing $32, whereas the one on the right is a 50 50 gamble between winning and losing $8. Mm. So participants made repeated choices between these different kinds of gambles and were asked their mood before and after each one to, to estimate the effect of, um, of the different outcomes on their mood. And specifically, they were given feedback both on the actual thing they chose and also on the thing that they didn't choose. Mm. So there's both factual feedback and counterfactual feedback here. Mm. This is the um, this is the data. So let me unpack this. This is one of those very kind of hand-drawn figures from psychology papers from the 1990s. Um, so what goes on on the left here is these are all the cases where you lose eight uh, dollars. On the left here is if you lose eight dollars, but the other thing that could have happened with the gamble that you chose was losing thirty-two dollars. This is where the other thing that could have happened with the gamble that you chose was winning thirty-two dollars. Uh, this is and then this the difference between the two lines is the counterfactual. Um, and so basically, there's a lot going on in this figure, but the main thing to look at is the difference between this line and this line, and the difference between this line and this line, is basically saying that like, you feel better when the outcome of the other gamble, the thing you didn't choose, was a loss, and you feel worse, all other things being equal, when the outcome of the gamble that you didn't choose was a win. And that's true whether you, you lose or win $8. Um, and there's some equations there, but this is just to show that if you simulate this integrated advantage model, you can kind of capture some of these, these same phenomena. Um, there's other things I could show you to do with the actual typicality effect and things, but I feel like I've run on a little bit long. So maybe, maybe that now that might be a good place to, to leave things and kind of start discussion. What do you think? No, it's fine. I mean, as you, as you like. Um, and also, you know, see if we have a um, question at this point, and then if not, maybe we can extend your further presentation. Whatever you like. I don't want to be in All right. Uh, is there any question uh, so far? No question from YouTube as well. Maybe should we ask to go further? Yeah. Okay. Maybe I'll show you one, one, at least one more slide, which is this action typicality thing, which is sorry. So so far, uh, so the, all this mood is either positive or negative, right? Yeah, that's right. So this is one asking to report their mood. Like, how do you feel on a on a scale? The, the scale varies between different studies. Um, how do you feel on a scale from very unpleasant? I see. Yeah. So this is, I mean, I, I know you're interested in the kind of the, the would, would be better the kind of the qualia structure of yeah. emotional experience. Yeah. So that's kind of assuming that that, that it's kind of pre-assuming that that is the dimensionality of qualia which I don't know. That's uh, yeah, I, you know, th probably uh, to really imagine what it feels like to be a subject of this experiment, I need to be, you know, uh, doing this, you know, experiment. But uh, so do. Would you would you feel like uh, it's uh, uh, sufficient to capture the sort of experience of the participants uh, in this task by kind of uh, unidimensional you know axis of the valence or yeah. is there more going on to capture these things? In these, so the first thing to say is that these tasks that we give people. So I, I, I have a separate line of research which is that I design these tasks and I you know, embed you know, questions about how they're feeling in them and I look to see how kind of task variables relate to that. Mm. Um, in our experience, yes, this kind of bipolar scale does seem to do a pretty good job of accounting for variance. Mm -hmm. At least if we go to sort of a separate positive affect dimension and a separate negative affect dimension, it doesn't look like there's much more, um, much extra variance that we can't explain. Okay. Um, but the proviso to that is that is kind of based on putting people in these very impoverished artificial environments where the only things that are going on are the outcomes of these gambles that we are, we are giving them. That probably misses some of the important psychological structure of real world experiences. Um, to give just one example, there's no social component. So mm. um, everyone's familiar with this in academic research, social comparison is, is something that influences influences mm. emotion. 
that's not something that's going on in the um, uh, in this house. Are you ill? Yeah, please go ahead. Yeah, I'm just thinking about the uh, results you're showing here, uh, and then contrasting it against your uh, definition of mood previously, which was talking about it as non-intentional. Um, so not depending yeah, on the, not depending on the outcomes of like particular trials. Yeah. Um, I presume what's relevant here is you're doing lots and lots of trials with a particular memory sequence, so that's why it still relates to that. Yeah, that non-intention. That's right. Yeah. So we so, not in this specific model, but in some other stuff. So maybe, maybe sorry, maybe I'm, I'm cutting you off, but just to say, in some of the other work, we sort of look to see how the effect of these things decay back over successive trials. Um, and other people have done this before before us, like Robert Rutledge, most most prominently. Um, and we find that there's a pretty sharp decay curve. So the effect of, of the outcome from two trials ago is roughly half of the effect of the outcome from the most recent trial, and then half again, another trial back, and then half again, another trial back. So it does seem like it's inter integrating over a few time, uh, a few trials, but at least with the experiments that we're using, it's a fairly short time ago of integration, which raises the question as to whether we are really measuring this mood thing. I, I think that's an important open question. Yeah, great. So that answered half of my question. The other half is I'm just wondering if you take like baseline measurements from patient, uh, not patients, subjects, um, or if you do like a psych evaluation of them ahead of time, so you like see what their general baseline mood is like, uh, does that have like clear indications on the time curves? And does it like change the curve or does it just change like the set point of it? Really, really great question, yeah. So this is something I'm, I'm kind of looking at a little bit. Um, first, we've read Rob Rutledge also did a study kind of along these lines and looked at the effects of these different sorts of appraisals on, um, on mood and looked to see whether they were different between uh, patients with depression and healthy controls, for instance. Uh, there he found that there wasn't any difference in any of the appraisals and the only thing that really distinguished patients and controls was sort of the average level of, of self-reported mood. So those with depression self-reported lower mood, which is no, which is no great surprise. Um, I, I've done a little bit of stuff in a similar vein. I've never found that, so I've been looking at kind of subclinical things. So you know, what, what correlates with symptoms of depression in the general population? That's, that's what I can kind of talk about. Um, and I've never found that it correlates with the um, with this, this model parameter that quantifies the, the, uh, the time scale of integration. Um, but it does correlate, it does seem to correlate with other things. Um, so you know, the effect, one of which is kind of the effect of rewards alone on, on mood seems to be correlated with some of these different psychiatric symptoms. That's just to talk about the kind of separate line of research. But yeah, I, I think basically there's a bunch of really interesting open questions in this space. Um, the time scale of integration is a, one I haven't thought about as much, but I think it's, I think it's a really kind of psychologically important Great. I actually have one further question, but yeah, I'll let other people have a go if they have questions. Um, yeah, page four on tomorrow. So I'll, I, I wanted to ask that um, uh, non intentional. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, so you listed three things that you're trying to capture, and then two of them, um, you, you gave an example where um, you feel something based on some sort of outcome. So I've only do you have a concrete example of um, those two things? I can't remember what they were. Yeah, it, it, one of them was counterfactual, yeah. and the, the other one was on top of that. I can't remember. Uh, expectation. Expectation. Right. So, is there? Do you have a concrete example of just one standing um, where it's not based on like some sort of thing that's just happened, like getting less than you expected? Yeah. Um, what an interesting question. So much of what I'm thinking about has been to do with kind of the appraisal of individual events that I'm not. Well, one, okay, this is it's a slightly, slightly a dodge to answer to your question because I think it's a kind of deep question that goes to. I've, I've basically just been concentrating on that aspect of things, so I don't haven't spent a lot of time thinking about the non appraisal components of this. There are other people that who have. Um, you can also think of psychological events. Um, events that just kind of aren't going on in the external world, but that are present to your kind of to your subjective experience as kind of playing into this a little bit as well. Like you know, I'm lying awake in bed at 3 a.m. and for some reason I'm I'm remembering uh, an awkward interaction I had in high school when I was 15. That's I think that kind of occurs in other ways. But, um, so that that is not something that's happened in the internal world, but that I can tell you that that has a, a kind of emotional effect on me. So I. It's kind of a dodge answer to say that like it's not just things in the external world, but I think it's also things in the internal world. But I don't I don't have a good answer to that. Okay. Thanks. Um, and, and maybe a second question. 
Yeah. Um, so if I understand the general, okay, then um, well that, then what affects mood is this policy rather than the action. So in terms of like the real world application where you want to change your mood, mm -hmm. then is this implying that you can change your mood just by changing the way you think about going going about that? It, that's an interesting potential possibility. Yeah. So, okay, maybe maybe that's actually a really good segue to the next slide. I'll, I'll come back to that if I if yeah, I sure. um, So, the third thing was the, this action typicality effect, which is I mentioned the example of getting into a car crash and driving on one street where this was driving on didn't feel very good. Um, I uh, another way of saying this is to say that changes in mood are greater in magnitude following uncommon actions than following common actions. And when I say greater in magnitude, they're not all better or all worse. The kind of um, the good is more good, the bad is more bad, um, following uncommon actions. Sorry, um, and the thing to say here is that um, this policy weighted reward difference, which is one way of estimating advantage, because as you say, it depends on the policy of choosing an action. This kind of captures this, and you can sort of simulate the amount of the policy weighted reward difference as a function of the policy of the chosen action in some sort of synthetic like, choice environments. What you find is that, so this we would claim kind of corresponds to the amount of uh, emotional reaction to an individual event, and on the x axis is the prior probability of taking that event. So the, what's going on here is that as you always take an event, your emotional reactions to that event kind of shrink to almost zero in this model. But for things that you very rarely do, the emotional reaction is very strong. So to come back to your question, yes, it sort of implies that if you want to change your mood more, you should uh, do things that you don't normally do. But it's kind of a risky game because you're as likely to have an extreme positive experience as to have an extreme negative experience. I see. Yeah. Thanks. Yeah. And yeah, so this this was just the other the other point I want to slide on to get to. Just I, there's a kind of conceptual sense in which the mechanics of advantage in the model account for these interesting phenomena in, in the model. And that maybe, maybe that's what nice to, to kind of draw a line on. So, so the right side of the figure is that uh, when you encounter uh, the outcome that you are not expecting? Uh, so this isn't necessarily expecting or not expecting. This is just uh, any, any outcome. Um, so things above mm -hmm. zero uh, on, the, on the vertical, these are going to be pleasant things. Mm. The, you know, receiving rewards. Things down here are going to be receiving punishments or non-rewards. Mm. Um, but the emotional response is going to be stronger when a reward or non-reward comes after an action that you don't normally choose. I see. So if I understand correctly, to to the if you go to the right, yeah. uh, then it's more like a sort of a, your emotional reaction against us, your habit. Exactly. Right? These, these would be kind of habitual. The extreme right would be habitual actions. And then your this model kind of uh, suggests that the, for your habit, you don't uh, invoke your emotion. It's, but it's, is it's it extreme, really? like there's a funnel shape in this, in this model. I'm, oh. sure, I'm sure the real world experience of habits is, is a little different, but the, the prediction is that if you, let's say you're doing a task that's designed to, you know, you take an action so often that it becomes habitual on the basis of rewards. You, know, you, you learn to, maybe it's a motor learning task where you learn to kind of tap buttons in a sequence to get a reward. Mm -hmm. You do this for 10 days. Um, on day one, sometimes you don't get it right and you miss your reward. Um, on the other way around, sorry, better. On day one, when you get it right, you, you're not usually getting it right. And so when you get a reward, your emotional reaction to that reward is stronger. But by day 10, when you're doing this right every single time, um, the emotional response you have to that reward is uh, it's going to be less strong because the action that you're taking is the action that you always take. That's the prediction of this model. Because it's kind of interesting because I, I was tell, uh, talking to Angus about this habit or sort of the, you know, uh, common behaviors uh, benefit uh, just before, you know, we meet uh, today. But uh, I, I started kind of, you know, making lots of habits every day mm -hmm. during this, you know, corona period, lockdown period. And then I kind of noticed that the habit makes more pleasure in general. Interesting. So that would be uh, 
that would be garbage fun today. So that would be something I've done. Uh, one, one thing I can imagine is that the, the, when, when you talk about the habits or you know this kind of task, uh, the frequency or time scale is not really uh, coming into the picture, right? That's right. Yeah, that's what I'm saying. Yeah, like, you know, I can imagine that if, I, if I'm doing one thing over and over again during the day, then I might actually just stop you know, feeding anything after you know, one hour or two hour or something like that. But the, if you do only one thing at a time and uh, you know, once per day, Every time it's like, you know, new experience. And uh, by doing, ma making it a habit, and you feel like, you know, you've become better and better. I, I feel, I think you know, it's probably generally the case that, uh, yeah, the pressure increases, probably. Maybe you're right, that's, that's an empirical question. Mm. What if you try something new and then you find it even more effective than the previous method, and you'd be like, yeah, this is so good. But then if you try something new and then it works out really bad, and you'd be like, you should, should never have mm. that kind of reaction. So one way, an example I sometimes give is, um, let's say you have a restaurant that you always go to, you have a favorite restaurant, and when you go to this restaurant, you always order the same thing on the menu. So that's kind of habitual in some sense, it would be up, up the right end of the scale mm. here. So that's a, you know, when I, when I go to my local um, uh, Malaysian restaurant, I always order chunk which is like, the dish that I like. So if I, order something different for a change. Maybe they're out of that and I have to order something different or maybe I just want to change. And I don't enjoy it like as much, then I'm gonna have a really strong negative reaction. But the prediction is that if I try something new and, and enjoy it, the emotional reaction will be even stronger still. So I tried to I tried to get non-student interested in this project this year because the implication is that, um, so we can divide our actions into actions that you might be familiar with kind of exploration and exploitation mm. dilemma. Mm. So, because exploration, exploratory actions are kind of by definition actions that you don't take very often. And so the implication is that if you look at emotional responses to actions, to outcomes of exploratory actions, and emotional responses uh, to exploitative actions, that you should have stronger emotional responses after exploratory actions and less strong after exploitative. I don't know if that's going to be the case or not, but it's kind of a prediction of, of this way of thinking about it. Mm. Maybe Ariel has been raising the hand for a long oh, time, sorry. so maybe, yeah. No, no, that's all right. I have a slight related but tangential question. Um, are there any clear animal model studies um, for the experiments that you've been running that are good analogies? Um, it's a really interesting question. Yes and no. Yes, in the sense that it's very easy to set up a task where you um, uh, where you give an animal counterfactual feedback and you see what happens. People have done that. That's you know, there's a there's a, there's a literature on counterfactual learning. No, in the sense that you can't ask the animal how it's feeling. Um, and so, and so this, this is the difficult thing that kind of, in some ways I feel restricts me to working with human participants, is that there's an important kind of subjective, uh, what I'm measuring is the effect of these outcomes on subjective experience. And you know, there, may, there are maybe brain states or, or kind of behavioral profiles that correlate with subjective experience in animals, but I, uh, it's, it's kind of a slightly more tenuous link. Yeah, that, that's what I've been sitting here trying to think of whether there's a good way of assessing like mood in an animal model. I know they have in the affective literature like really crappy ways of trying to measure like depressive levels or anxiety levels. For yeah, example, like, like a test like, session like, task and that. Yeah, yeah, or full swing test or those sorts of things. But I was wondering, like, more applicable to you, whether there's some sort of experiment you could do where like the animal would only do it if it was in a good mood, and if you can do it if it was in a bad mood. So like something with like. Some like it's got it's a completely fixed task with like some fixed level of reward and yeah. some fixed level of annoyance. And like if it's happy, it'll do it, and if it's like irritated, it won't do it. Yeah. Um, so this is I was just wondering if you knew of something like that. This is, I, I, have, I have a couple of ideas, maybe it's maybe it's reckless to speculate in the public forum, but there you go. Um, uh, one idea is um, you can do some sort of effort expenditure for a reward. So, you know, how, how willing are you to engage in an ethical task for, for reward? There's some reason to think that might co vary with. with state in some ways. Mm -hmm. The more positive function you're feeling, the more likely you are to observe the effect of a reward, mm -hmm. maybe. Um, the other one is Mike Mendel is a guy from the University of Bristol who does a lot of interesting things to do with measuring well-being in animals. Mm -hmm. And uh, so I think, um, I think he's in the Department of Zoology in Bristol. But he has this interesting task where it was designed, I think, originally to measure the well-being of farm animals. Mm -hmm. And the idea is that one way you can do this is by okay, training to see what an animal's well-being is. Um, I'm probably mischaracterizing that. Um, you can train them that a certain stimulus, uh, maybe a high-pitched tone, means reward. 
and uh, another stimulus, a low pitch tone means punishment. And then you give them a stimulus in the middle of those two things, and you see whether they treat it as a reward or a punishment. And the finding was that as animal well-being improves, they're more likely to treat this sort of ambiguous intermediate stimulus as, as rewarding. And the more distress they're in, the more likely they are to treat it as, um, as punishing. So maybe, you know, there's, there's obviously other kind of cognitive processes going on there, but that, that could be an interesting uh, kind of angle as well. It would be a pretty sophisticated task to try and embed that in kind of a learning task or something, but it could be, could be an interesting project. Yeah, no, that, that, that's, a, that's a cool problem. To think of at the end, like that'd be cool to integrate. It'd just be nice to see like some neurophysiology at the I same know, time yeah, yeah, these yeah. experiments. So. But yeah, thanks, thanks for the speculation. And we won't tell anyone. <laughs> if you if you publish this paper in uh, in three years time, I'm not. <laughs> Uh, James and uh, Trevor is using already yeah. the dynamometer, right? So Trevor and I, we've been chatting a little bit about, about trying to... Uh, we, we, we can cut this part from YouTube later. <laughs> <laughs> it's okay. Fine. Fine. With, with respect to uh, that, you know, uh, again, you know, Kianshin's comment um, coming back, um, I, I feel like uh, the one advantage of doing the same thing every day at a particular you know, fixed time yeah. is that you become actually more aware that you know, any kind of slight difference by doing it. You know, like you know, going into the restaurant is also relatively a rare event, right? You know, uh, maybe, you know, uh, yeah, if, you yeah, I don't know. I mean, maybe because I, I have family potentially. So, <laughs> but uh, if you go there every day, maybe, you know, you have a set standard and a set expectation. And then, you know, changing that thing itself may be kind of, you know, enjoyable experience per se. But uh, if you change things every time, then you also don't notice the, you know, difference. You become less sensitive to the difference. And that's probably... One thing I, I kind of noticed, like, you know, doing exercise, ex exactly the same exercise every day. Mm -hmm. I feel much better in, oh, I, I have some kind of slight pain here or, you know, <laughs> wh whatever, you know. You, you notice that uh, when you become like 40 years old. But uh, you can't notice that if you change, you know, your, if you don't establish a routine. Same goes for the, you know, nighttime uh, or, you know, waking up or, you know, doing many things, actually. Mm -hmm. And noticing that. I don't know whether this is true for everybody, but that is in, in itself rewarding or, yeah, interesting. It's interesting, isn't it? I, there's other things going on that I haven't really touched on here. Um, and related to your point, there's a couple of really interesting things to do with control. Oh. So um, how much, like on average, it should be the case that outcomes I have no control over should be kind of higher variance than outcomes I have control over. Because mm -hmm. when I have control over it, I can push it towards the outcome that I like. Mm -hmm. When I don't have control over it, it um, uh, it, could, it can be anything. Mm. So that's one aspect of things, but there's another aspect of things which I think is close to what you're saying, which mm. is that the mere fact of perceiving that I have control over something mm. is itself pleasant. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Um, so I think it's also related to meditative kind of you know effects, right? As well. In that's a sense. interesting. Though. I had never thought, I hadn't thought about that just now. But I, I think you know what you said about control and also you know, noticing this sounds like meditation component, no? Don't you think? Yeah, mindfulness. I, I was thinking, like, how do you consider maybe like different levels of moods? Like, kind of, you have your first of all, like, you just stress or something, mm -hmm. um, and you're like, sort of mood. But then, say, if you if you do meditation or you mindfulness or something like that, and then you have some sort of higher awareness that you are feeling stress, mm -hmm. and you have this interest mood on top of this stress mood, so you're kind of like two two layers of mood now. Um, I don't know. It, it, there's an interesting kind of like, would it be fair to say it's kind of like an ad cognitive? Yeah. Kind of thing. Right, 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 right. The, maybe this applies to a lot of us because we're kind of in the scientific field. It is, in some ways, it's, it's enjoyable, it's pleasurable to understand why something is, is the way it is. Like, mm. I, don't just, I don't just want to be able to predict what happens. Mm. I want to be able to understand why. You know, I, I, uh, I don't just want to be able to predict that I'm not going to fall off my bike when I'm riding down the street. Mm. I find it enjoyable to understand that it's to do with a particular kind of, you know, if, you're, if my momentum is enough, then, then it's not in my center of gravity, it's in, it's in a place where things are not going to fall over. Mm. You know, like that, 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 that understanding that, that um, we're, we're straying from kind of measurable things a little bit, but I, I feel that that kind of 
the ability to, to accurately predict and explain why things are the way they are is kind of that's the, there's a psychological element there that is that itself has a has a valence, I think. So maybe this comes back to your earlier question, which was like you're talking only about outcomes. Um, there are I, I you know I wouldn't dispute at all that there are kind of solely psychological events that also have, have valence. Um, one of which for instance which goes back to my PhD work is, is uncertainty. People find uncertainty mm. kind of diverse. Some of the stuff I did in my PhD was you know people will seek information to resolve uncertainty even though they can't use the information. Mm -hmm. So that's, and there's all, when I, when I say that, you know, I have this model and it explains these three things, I, I'm not making the huge name, it's just claim that these, these are all of the things that aren't moved, because I think there are lots of things, very interesting things going on as well. The cool thing about this work for me is kind of seeing how many things kind of fall out of this one kind of relatively simple looking equation. But that doesn't mean that's all looking at the same object. Mm -hmm. Had any kind of investigation or do you know of any work looking at um, kind of the the level of transparency of this mood to the person? So oh, for like, yeah. yeah, yeah, like for example, if someone doesn't realize this, like for example, maybe they are not mindful of their mood, um, how is that affecting this kind of relationship? That's a really interesting question because especially as you go to clinical populations, like you know, the basic Basic paradigm in this field, you know, you, you get someone in an experiment, you get them to observe some events, and you ask them to report their moods at different points in time. Implicitly, that is assuming that the person is able to give you maybe not an exact measurement, but at least kind of an unbiased measurement that you know maybe it's a little higher, maybe it's a little lower than average. It's in it's in the right place. But actually, in fact, we know that there are particular psychological disorders that are associated with um, this concept called alexithymia, for instance, which is some people don't have technically it's not, not having language for 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 emotions, but more broadly, you can think about it like people people have difficulty introspecting about their own emotional states and understanding how they're feeling and why they're feeling that way. Mm. Um, as inside my my partner tells me that I have this a little bit when I am when I'm hungry, like I have I, like I call this something I get really upset and angry and I'm snappy, and then I I have a sandwich and I'm feeling better, and I don't know that I'm feeling hungry, but, but I am. Mm. And you ask me to rate my hunger on a, on a on a scale, you know, like, I'm not hungry at all. <laughs> Ariel? Yeah, Ariel. Yeah, sorry, I could ask questions about this stuff all day. Um, I'm just curious as well, so you've been doing all these moods where you've been defining mood or increasing mood changes through like uh, explicit changes in outcomes that are like consciously available to the participant and showing them the counterfactuals. Um, I'm curious about what happens if you influence the participant's mood in a ways that they are completely unconscious of, either pharmacologically or otherwise. Um, yeah, really. Although the ethics may not let you do that experiment, so maybe that hasn't been done. Well, you can you can kind of yeah like covert psychopharmacology probably probably is in the past muster, but um, you can you can imagine like a more uh, there are some. There are a bunch of different ways of inducing mood in the laboratory, and I don't find any of them kind of completely, completely satisfying. But one that I kind of like as a way of doing minor improvements and deteriorations in mood is there's a group who um, do mood inductions via quiz tasks. Mm. So they do like trivial pursuit quiz outcomes, and it just happens that sometimes they give you a bunch of easy questions, and it just happens that sometimes they give you a bunch of hard questions. And people feel good after they do the easy questions, and they feel bad after they do the, the hard questions. But they don't think that those questions are kind of designed to change. Yeah, I mean, one, I'm kind of interested in kind of, now, now that we have this theoretical framework, I'm sort of interested in poking at it and seeing how it behaves under different conditions. And one thing I'm thinking is, you know, if you can measure the effects of positive and negative counterfactuals, um, you can also change people's mood and see whether the effects of those different things change. So we've seen a little bit of evidence of this already in the sense that people who, are, who report more depression when they do these tasks tend to be, tend to show more reactivity to negative things than positive things. I need to replicate the result and make sure it comes out of it. Which kind of suggests that it, this isn't just a kind of a linear dynamical system, it's a, it's a non-linear one where you know the effect of any appraisal on my mood doesn't just affect doesn't just well, the kind of appraisal maybe this is a better way to say it. The kind of appraisal that I make of something depends on what mood I'm in. And 
and that introduces some really interesting but kind of difficult to study to non-linear dynamics. Okay, maybe you know in uh, ten minutes we are probably uh, wrapping up. So uh, if you can go to the take uh, take home message and also talk about so that you are future oriented. You know what what you are planning to do or what you are interested in. Yeah, yeah, would be great. So I there's four points here. This is I've talked mostly about the first two. There's like another twenty five slides in this presentation that talk about the, the other ones. Um, the first one is like the there's a whole line of things. So. I, I flash up this thing. The, the idea is that um, why the frame of the glass was why would an agent navigating its world need mood? Why would that be helpful to it? And why would the mood be influenced by rewards and observations of mind? Why might it affect actions? And one thing that we've been finding a little bit, so I've been presenting this side of the model, there's another side of the model as well, which I haven't talked about, but which is in the paper for anyone who's interested, um, which is it sort of turns out that in some environments, if you let the actions that you're taking be influenced by your mood, that kind of acts as a really nice counterweight. So let me explain what I mean. Like if you're in a, uh, an environment you can't control very well, then a lot of the time, even when you do the right thing, you, you get feedback telling you you've done the wrong thing. Mm -hmm. So think back to the, kind of the game show example. Even when, in this contrived example, even when you did the right thing, it shows the door on the left, mm -hmm. you know, on that particular trial, you could have done better by choosing the door on the right. So it's only been sort of averaging across multiple trials that you that you kind of start to learn to do to do the right thing. And so the idea is that, well, maybe one reason that having a mood variable kind of floating around in your cognitive system might be useful is if it keeps track of the fact that you've been doing the right thing recently and things have been going well recently, and things are, and you're generally in a positive mood, then you're not going to change your policy too much just from one or two negative examples. So it's kind of like instead of being incredibly reactive to individual events, maybe having this variable that keeps track of how things have been going recently um, can sort of prevent you from uh, changing what you're doing too much in response to things that are beyond your control in the environment. Mm -hmm. That's kind of the, the general idea about that. Um, uh, The stuff that I'm, you know, this is stuff that I did my first job. The stuff that I'm doing now, I'm trying to, this is all theoretical work, I'm trying to do a lot of the empirical work now. So, you know, the project here, as it is with kind of a lot of, you know, psychological theory papers, is to find effects of mood and see if your, see if your model can explain them. What I'm trying to do, sometimes the evidence base for those things is not all that, all that strong. So what I'm trying to do now is to look at the different aspects of this model and see whether it corresponds to things that I can measure in. In simple behavioral tasks is kind of my, my bread and butter, that's what I do spend most of my time doing. But you could also imagine you know, neuroimaging experiments where you find the neural coral of one of these things and see whether that can allows you to distinguish between one and another model of what mood might be. Um, I don't do a lot of neuroimaging these days, so that's I don't know, that's kind of a naive way to sort of raise things. But there have been some kind of interesting work where if you have a model of what mood is uh, and you have someone in the scanner, then you don't have to ask them what their mood is is every trial, you can sort of, if you have a bunch of trials where you do ask them and a bunch of trials where you don't ask them, then you can build a classifier or, or something using the trials where you do ask them to calculate kind of a neural proxy for mood and use that to work out what might be going on even when you, when you don't ask them. That again is an idea that comes from some work done in this project. So I think like, there are a bunch of interesting sort of empirical examples that I'm kind of interested in digging into. Um, to give one example, I had another student this year I'm looking to recruit PhD students at the moment, that's, that's happening right now. But I have another student who's doing a project where I'm trying to look at the relationship between um, uh, how much people learn from counterfactual information and how strong their emotions are. And so it asks whether do, do people who have stronger emotional reactions to counterfactual information, so let's say in the game show example, people have a really strong response, do they also change their behavior more in response uh, to that? So is there a link between the emotional response and the, kind of the, the cognitive response? That's just kind of one example. How you might kind of take this work and sort of test the empirical aspects of it. Mm -hmm. um, but I'm really interested in kind of uh, this group. Thinks kind of about the philosophical structure of, of experience. That's something I've, 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 you know, I've read a little bit about philosophy of emotion, but I, the, the consciousness stuff is just kind of way outside my area. So if there are interesting things that jump out of this that make contact with what you're working on, I'd be really interested in talking more. Yeah. Okay. Thank you.
Uh, is there any comments or questions? Ronnie, do you have anything? Or William, you haven't asked questions? Comments? Or anyone on the... Um, maybe just yep. a, a comment, like when you have that graph uh, was uh, zeroing uh, while increasing, for me it really like immediately made me think of uh, equanimity. Uh, the, the one tapering uh, as probability was increasing, so the the reward was like going down to zero, like the, the emotional uh, the mood response. And that for me really like resonated with the equanimity, where and kind of like also with meditative uh, and like being aware and in control. Mm. Like when when I feel in control, I don't get reward, but like I just like I'm I'm zeroing. Mm. I'm, you might as well sorry. Yeah, I read lots of stories, so like, yeah, for sure. I guess. <laughs> <laughs> no, I, I think there's an interesting, there's a, there's a whole set of literature too, mm. you know, where this, how how should emotion be related to well-being? Mm -hmm. You know, have feeling the same emotion every day, maybe it's not related to the, to the subjective well-being, but having extremes of emotion maybe isn't either. So I think there's, there's like a separate literature there. You can just you know, one crude way of looking is just look at measures of well-being, psychological functioning. How do they? How do they relate to you know, how, how strong your mood changes? Mm -hmm. So these you know, events in these silly little cognitive tasks, which objectively shouldn't shouldn't matter to you at all, but I can tell you when you, when you get people to do these tasks, some people don't care. Some people have mm -hmm. the same mood throughout the experiment. It's kind of like they're saying, screw you, and I don't care about your experiment. And some people have kind of really strong uh, and predictable kind of shifts in what they do. And so understanding where that kind of individual difference in mm -hmm. comes from, I think it would be really interesting. With respect to sort of uh, the link we, between you know what we do and what you're interested, in, well, one thing that I've been always thinking about this kind of reward uh, learning type of literature is that uh, how, how kind of you know representative it is uh, in our everyday behavior. Um, definitely, you know, it's a good model to understand what's going on in the brain, which we can study in, you know, 30 minutes, one hour kind of, you know, range where which, which fits in your imaging and so on, right? But uh, something like a habit and uh, the thing that we are talking around here, which happens like, you know, on the scale of once in a day or, you know, things like that, it may be more interesting to possibly you know, study in a society uh, using you know, like an online setting or you know like app or yeah. something like that uh, in a large scale and uh, we, we actually do you know many of us do online experiments and also some of the students uh, uh, Nirumiti is for example also uh, in, in, with uh, Aniko showing some uh, emotional videos and then getting some you know subject rating yeah. and also feel and also uh, uh, chewing are also doing using these kind of things and uh, at, at the larger scale uh, looking at uh, you know subjective experience but do, do you have any kind of uh, intentional plan to go into that direction I would like to I mm. yeah I there's a whole literature on yeah so I there's kind of I do a little bit of a bait and switch in this world where I talk about you know something changes over a long period of time and it's integrated and then I show you results from you know, the integration of those two things or something mm, like that mm. and part of the reason is because it's the stuff I want to do that's how I get the empirical data but mm. there's, there's a whole literature on kind of ecological momentary assessment you know, measuring measuring mood over days or weeks or months right 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 and I, I'm, I don't do any of that work I think it would be really interesting I mean there's some basic questions like you know if your mood is more variable than a task like this is it also more variable um, across that's, there's definitely like there's this literature and there's that that really interesting literature which I am not part of, mm. and there's not really very many links in between. I think I think it could be a really interesting project to build. Yeah, maybe we can talk over the drink and so on, but. Uh... In terms of, for example, you know, if you think about the grants and so on, which we may not, have, we we shouldn't put in a YouTube. Maybe you know, I'll just stop the streaming no. now. <laughs> bye bye. But for for example, you know, uh, 